this time on Skeptico. Is your relationship with my client entirely platonic? Not! It's not your relationship with my client, boy! Bad baby, bad baby, mystery! You had sex with her every time you met, didn't you? Didn't you? Liar! He's badgering the witness. It's his witness. That's Jim Carrey from the movie Liar Liar, where a lawyer is cursed with having to tell the truth. You're going to hear more from Jim Carrey in just a minute. And you're also going to hear how there's this direct connection between lying, telling the truth, truth seeking, and liberty. Liberty is eroding at an alarming rate. That's today's guest, Mark Gober, talking about his new book, An End to Upside Down Liberty. And more generally, talking about the situation we find ourselves in today. Now, I don't want to go too dramatic, too conspiratorial, because that turns off people. But we do go a little Nazi on this one. But sticking to the Nazi parallel, because it's easy, we're burning books now. When you're banning people, deplatforming people, people who have uh, PhDs, have a long history of publishing in peer-reviewed medical journals, and they're pulled from all the platforms. Everywhere we look, there is an ideology. And if you don't agree with that ideology, whether it's medically or politically or anything, you're a conspiracy theorist, you're spreading dangerous misinformation, which are, these are very anti-scientific ideas. The, the exploration of science or anything in the world is to explore and to explore many different theories. And right now, there's less and less of an inability to do that. Uh, one of the things I looked at in this book is the impact of mind control, uh, propaganda, brainwashing through multiple venues. So mainstream media, but also through social media and tech. Because if we think about the way in which we view the world and the way uh, the reasons that we have opinions about the world are informed by what we personally experience, which is very limited, and what we're told. And that comes about through social media, the news, books we read. And if what we can research outside of our own individual experience is being limited intentionally, where certain ideas, no, we can't talk about that. That's going to be censored. That's going to be shadow banned, where you can't see it as easily. Then there is a capacity to alter consciousness on a mass scale. I know, shadow banning, censoring, yada, yada. But if you've been around this show for a while, you know that the origins of the show are really with the frontier science people. I'm talking about people in parapsychology, in near-death experience science, in after-death communication science, reincarnation science. I could go on and on. All the people who have pushed back against this crazy, you are a biological robot in a meaningless universe, and you have no connection to anything more. We fought that battle. So why aren't we battle tested? Why aren't we the first ones to stand up and sound the alarm about where this ship is headed? And to a certain extent, I guess the reason I get so hyped up about it is that if we can't call it from what we've seen in the last 10 years in the frontier science consciousness community, if we, we, were, we were there, we were the frontiersmen, arrows in the front and arrows in the back. We should be the people that said, look, here's how it happened back then. And here's how it's being amped up 10 times in terms of the co-opting of science, really the just complete assault on science. Well, I hear you, Alex. I think it's, uh, th there seems to be a divide I've noticed not only in the frontier science community, but also in the spiritual community. And the way that I look at it at the highest level is that it's perhaps an inability and an unwillingness to recognize evil and the, the hiddenness of evil to say, well, I don't see how that could happen. I can't understand the mechanism for how someone could do that. Therefore, no, it must be that we'll take the benign explanation, which is that it's just that people can't shift their paradigms, which is part of it too. A divide, a divide between those who can see or at least contemplate the hiddenness of evil and those who can't. Continuing with this clip. There are probably scientists out there who just can't shift their paradigms. They're not part of a psyop and they just are, that's how they are. But this seems to be systematic, the way in which there are, there are six sigma statistical results. And Dean Radin talks about this in his book, Real Magic, which was endorsed by two Nobel Prize winning scientists in the categories of telepathy, remote viewing, precognition, and psychokinesis. That means the odds against chance are more than a billion to one, meaning in any other area of science, that's a real phenomenon. And yet, if you talk about psychokinesis, if I talk about that to my professors from Princeton, they'd probably tell me I'm crazy. 
how does that happen? There, there's something, there's, there's a suppression going on. I, I would say that I'm probably more open to this because of my professional experience. And maybe you have a similar experience, Alex. I saw stuff. I, I saw corruption firsthand in a way that is, was very damaging to people's lives. So I worked a lot with intellectual property. I, I, was, I was in investment banking in New York first, which was more tr just traditional stuff, not in tech. Um, but then I worked in the tech space where we worked with inventors at large companies and small companies who were challenging paradigms. So an invention, a, a patented technology is one that is both novel and non-obvious. That's the legal definition relative to the prior art, everything that, that's been done in the past. Meaning that if you get a patent on something, you're contradicting, you're contradicting what the mainstream is doing. And there's a lot of pushback often. So you can imagine what might happen when you have some smaller inventors going up against big companies. What could happen where the big companies who have lots of power can manipulate the system? So I saw it. I've seen the media manipulate things. I've seen the, the judicial system get manipulated all up and down the power structures. So I'm, I'm more open to it. And then the whole COVID thing happens and it's the same thing. A person has a, a somewhat benign observation that contradicts the mainstream narrative. They're booted off YouTube. So there begins to be a pattern and one has to recognize that not everyone is moral. I agree with Mark on this one. People who've been in a highly competitive money oriented field quickly learn that not everyone can maintain the moral compass, but secondly, not everyone wears their moral compass like a wristwatch. The snakes in suits thing is real. But what if it's more than that? And at a spiritual level, this could relate to dark forces. That's how I look at it. Okay, so maybe science isn't in the best position to save us, but we can be saved, right? I mean, maybe our political leaders will rise up and do the right thing. The politics of it, that's gone, right? There is no real left, right, red state, Democrat. That doesn't really fit the bill here, right? I agree with you completely. And it's a super important point because there's a paradigm that people are in of, well, if you're not a Democrat, then you're a Republican and vice versa. And if you believe this, then you're part of this political movement. And it's this very divisive mentality. One of the things that I, I try to do in my book and end upside down liberty is to uh, transcend that, the left-right division, and get it more to the, the spectrum of liberty versus non-liberty, because really the left and the right have differing opinions on what the other party should be doing, which to me is counter to principles of liberty. And then that mentality becomes warped into an us versus them, and it, I think, can warp our ability to objectively look at science, because you might hear an opinion from that, let's say if you're a Democrat, that, oh, the right-wingers are saying this is true scientifically. I'm not a Republican. I think Republicans are evil. And because I'm a good person, I can't agree with that science. It's like this, this weird warped logic that removes objectivity from the situation. And I think it allows for greater mind control. So what should we do? Maybe the first thing we should do is return to Jim Carrey and take a good hard look at the reality of our situation. You're yeah. supposed to say, it's all going to be all right. And you're supposed to say, whatever you dream can come true. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to say all those things. I do believe in manifestation, power of that kind of stuff. But I don't believe that any of it matters. Everything is divine and I'm that. I'm finding that ultimately the, the freedom from it is, uh, is something people are kind of hungry for in a way. Right. They're like, I don't want to be me either. And I go, well, look, great, because you never have been. I so love what Jim Carrey's saying right there. But I got to say, it doesn't really hit me where I live. Back to a final clip from today's interview with the very excellent Mark Gober. I want to go back to something you said earlier about like, you know, should we be changing people's minds or are they on their own path? And for me, it, what I like to do is put information out and those who are interested might gravitate towards it. I, I'm not going to change people. And actually, I don't know their karmic path or their spiritual path. Maybe they're not supposed to change. But I always remember talking to a guy, and I won't mention his name, but he got very serious and he goes, never get between a seeker and their guru. I'm like, well, mm. I'll take that one on myself. Yes, I'm going to get between a seeker and their guru. So if your guru is any of the people who are peddling this pandemic, peddling, just trust me, give me all your uh, rights and all your liberties, and you'll be fine. 
if that's your guru, I will try and disrupt, not physically, but intellectually, I will try and disrupt that connection. And I do feel like that's my job because I think the foremost value is one, love everyone, but two, tell the truth. And that's mm -hmm. what I think you're trying to do. And that's what I'm trying to do too. We got to tell the truth. No choice. All right, let's get to some truth telling. Here's my interview with Mark Gober. If you like it, spread it around. Welcome to Skeptica, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Karras, and today we welcome back Mark Gober to Skeptico. Mark, as you may remember, is a very talented guy, investment banking background in Silicon Valley and New York. I mentioned that because I always find this super interesting. I mean, you will find Mark to be intelligent, no doubt. The first book we had him on to talk about an end to upside down thinking, very well written, even won a prize for it. But uh, you'll hear throughout in this interview, I think, and the reason I like it is Mark has his foot firmly planted in this world, you know, making money, being successful, being successful in school, doing all those things. And then, as you'll hear, he's kind of drifted off into this other world, this skeptical related world of consciousness and upside down thinking and his latest book and into upside down liberty. So anyways, I, I just remind you, that's what I think is so fun talking to Mark in particular, but people like Mark who are accomplished in a lot of different areas. So I don't know, I just kind of spun that out there. But Mark, welcome back. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, Alex. I'm looking forward to this. So as I mentioned, you wrote the book a couple years ago, all about consciousness and into upside down thinking, kind of pointing out this ridiculousness of consciousness is an epiphenomenon of the brain kind of stuff that is so entrenched in science and is maybe a little bit less entrenched, but we're reminded that it still is entrenched. And now you've followed it up with a book, An End to Upside Down Liberty. Tell us about the book. Tell us what it's about. So An End to Upside Down Liberty looks at the nature of government and the way in which society is organized generally. And what prompted the uh, investigation in that area was really the whole COVID thing. Um, starting in 2020, we, we saw that governments played a very important role in our lives. They told us which businesses were essential and which ones weren't, when we needed to be locked down and when we're not locked down, et cetera. So I started to look at, into, well, what is government? Um, how does the media play into that? And ultimately what the book looks at is um, in the idea that the way we do government around the world is inherently threatening to liberty, which is problematic, not only from a, just a traditional physicalist lens, but also from a spiritual lens, it's problematic. So that's it in a nutshell. So you're making some leaps there that uh, we ought to explore because I'm right there with you. But I have problems explaining this to people, number one. And number two, even kind of believing it myself in a couple of different ways. So let's start with the point you made about the connection between spirituality and what you're calling liberty. Well, so this is a a big leap for many people because one has to believe in something other than scientific materialism or what some would call physicalism in order to even go there, which is this idea that consciousness doesn't come from the brain. And that's what my first book and my podcast and my second book were really about. And that the idea that our identity is not our body, but rather our consciousness is our identity and the body is a vessel or, or the vehicle through which consciousness has an experience. So a lot of what I've done is looked at the science to suggest that that is true. So things like near-death experiences, psi phenomena, lots of stuff you've covered on your show. Then there are some inferences that we could make if we look at things like the near-death experience. Um, Dr. Bruce Grayson in his new book, After, which talks about near-death experiences and what he's seen, uh, he's from the University of Virginia. He says about 25%, he says a quarter of, of near-death experiences include a life review. And Dr. Jeffrey Long has said in the range of 20% of people who have near-death experiences in his database uh, have a life review. And what's a life review? This is an instance where a person relives his or her whole life in a flash. 
sometimes reliving the experiences through the eyes of other people and feeling the effects of his or her actions on that person. So if, for example, for my podcast, I interviewed Daniel Brinkley, who has had four near-death experiences, and each time he had a life review, he had to relive the deaths of the people that he killed when he was fighting in Vietnam through their eyes, so he claims. And he also felt the pain of the child who would no longer have a father because he had killed the father. However, in his later life reviews, after he had become a hospice volunteer, since the near-death experience changed him so much, he got to experience what it was like to be the dying person uh, in the hospice and getting to see how he himself comforted that person. So that's just an example. We, we see many other cases of this. So if we combine that life review, if we say that's a real phenomenon, not just a hallucination, this idea that there are consequences to our actions in life and we hold ourselves accountable. That's actually one of the big things in the life review is that it's not like there's a third party judging, which is what many religions have kind of turned it into. It's actually yourself, which aligns with this idea of a unified consciousness that you've talked about so much on the show. But this idea of, of consequences to our actions and a moral imperative, as you often say, that's real. If we combine that with things like the research at the University of Virginia, over 2,500 cases of young children who have memories of a previous life, sometimes these are kids between the ages of two and five years old, often, sometimes the, the researchers are able to verify what the child said by finding something from this alleged past life, finding a, a person's actual historical records, or sometimes even medical records if the child has birthmarks or physical deformities that align with this alleged previous life. So all that's to say there's evidence for reincarnation. So if there's reincarnation and this idea of a life review, which is suggestive of potentially a learning process inherent in life, that there's an evolutionary process uh, involved in consciousness itself, that might one might infer that the purpose of life or part of the purpose of life, to the extent we can comprehend it, is to evolve at the level of our consciousness, to move toward a state ultimately of unconditional love. That's what many people come back saying. But there might be other more nuanced things that we're trying to learn in any given life. So that is a long-winded way of saying that if we are to evolve, as I see it, we need to have liberty. We need to have the freedom to be able to make our own choices as much as possible. And ultimately, the way I look at it is making our own choices as long as they are not harming someone else. If we look at government, government restricts that liberty inherently. So I will just pause there, Alex, and, and let you respond. Well, I, I don't really have a response other than to say I didn't think it was long winded at all. It's okay. just right down Main Street in terms of my logical progression. I'm totally in line with you. And I think that that it's the path that the data leads us towards. And that's what you're saying, too. Speak to the leap, though, <laughs> the chasm that you're jumping. And I want to jump there with you. I just want to kind of in skeptical fashion pull back is the individual versus the collective. Mm. Because a lot of the great wisdom traditions throughout time have come to all these same things and then have come back to the same point of saying, yeah, but since it really is just about you and your journey and your soul ascension, education, evolution was the word you used, then maybe it doesn't matter so much what all those evildoers are doing, which is what I wrestle with too. But I know you get what I mean. How do you handle that question? I've been wrestling that that issue myself. I mean, that's a it's a tough question to, I think, to comprehend with our limited human minds. There might be things that are beyond our comprehension that we just are never going to fully grasp. But the way I like to think about it is exploring the notion of paradox. This idea that two things can be tr true at the same time, even though they're contradictory. Um, Rick Archer on Buddha at the Gas Pump always talks about this, that parado understanding paradox is one of the most important things in, in spiritual evolution. Many of the great teachers say that. And to me, the ultimate paradox in, in reality, as I see it, is this idea that we are one interconnected consciousness, and yet at the same time, we're individuals. So as Dr. Bernardo Castro says, it's like we're whirlpools within a stream of consciousness. We are both the whirlpool and the stream simultaneously. How could that be true? How could there be a Mark and an Alex and at the same time, there's no differentiation? And I think that's the paradox that we're forced to hold at the highest level, that there is no individual, but there is. There's only a collective, but there's not. That to me relates to this dualistic notion of good and evil. 
Because at some level, there's only unconditional love, one consciousness. That's what everyone talks about in the mystical experiences. It's the same thing or very similar ideas of a unified field. And yet there are things happening that are clearly contrary to unconditional love, atrocities that, that many of us see all over the world. How could that be true at the same time? So to me, there is, there is no evil. And at the same time, there is. And I'm, I'm reminded of, of uh, a little video I saw of, of Dr. David Hawkins, a spiritual teacher who was also a psychiatrist. So he was interesting to me because he deconstructed the ego at a practical level. But he talked about uh, Ramana Maharshi, the great Indian sage, who used to say things like, the world that we see doesn't exist. And Hawkins said, he's right. At the highest level of reality, that's true. Um, but at the same time, there are many people who aren't living at that level of reality, and they're enduring great suffering. So what Hawkins said is that it's a spiritual error to ignore the suffering at the level of this relative where, there's, where there are individuals. So to me, that's how I reconcile it, is that there is no evil, but there is, and we have a spiritual duty to do something about it. Yeah, that, so I don't know if people are following us, but now we're getting into it, because that's a very Western approach to kind of take the, the, the deep, deep teachings of it and then say, yeah, but none of that matters because I'm a doer. I'm a Western guy. I want to make it happen kind of thing. Ah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm a Western kind of person, but I'm also a, an American yogi too. Have you ever seen the movie Flipside by no. uh, Richard Martini? Mm -mm. Interesting guy. He uh, got very interested in the past life regression and between lives regression of uh, Newton. And he actually went to a weekend retreat where he and other people were going through a past life in between life re regression with the Newton Institute kind of people. But the anecdote that he tells that it, it always sticks in my head is this woman is regressed to a past life. And she remembers a life when she was in the Holocaust in the con in a concentration camp. And she remembers being led to her death. She realizes that the showers aren't showers. She knows that she is going to die and all these people are going to die. And immediately the thought rises in her, what should I do? Should I attack the guards? Maybe I should at least take somebody with me. You know, all the thoughts that I think so many people hear about these Holocaust stories, they all go, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they, you know, it's like one that's impossible. You know, people don't realize how impossible it is. But the other aspect of it is her. She comes to the sense that I will stay with my people. This life may end, I, this life will end. I will walk into the gas chamber, I will be killed, and this life will end. Further in her regression, she remembers dying and remembers the feeling of empathy for the perpetrators, for the guards, and feeling at that deep soul level that we're talking about that her suffering was over and their suffering had just begun and their suffering to a certain extent would would be much much harder to unravel than her suffering of just ending this life i'm not suggesting that we let them roll us up and just destroy us with the pandemic that's not my thing i'm just kind of calling into question how looking at this from a spiritual perspective might cause us to really put first what you're saying, which is, what does it mean to love everybody? What does it mean to love Anthony Fauci and Bill Gates and whoever else you want to hate on or, or in Pizzagate, James Elephantus and John Podesta? What does it mean to truly not agree with or support what those people are doing but to realize that, you know, it, it is on some level uh, not in our hands to administer the justice that will come to them. Any thoughts mm -hmm. on any of that? <laughs> yeah. So actually, in my second book, It Ends Upside Down Living, I talk about 10 approaches for living from the spiritual perspective, and there's a section on forgiveness. And I reference an interview that Rick Archer did on Buddha at the Gas Pump, a woman who was being murdered. And there was a mystical experience that happened while she was being murdered, where the attempted murderer effectively had an awakening and saw what he was doing and realized and ended up letting her go. Um, but in that process, she felt she was able to experience his pain 
and was able to have forgiveness for him, even though he was murdering her. So I, I think that aligns with what you're saying. And I agree with you that there's a balance though, that I try to hold and I struggle with, which is accepting that reality of having empathy for all, even those who are acting in ways that are contrary to unconditional love. And at the same time, maintaining boundaries and saying that this is not aligned with how I look at life and therefore there have to be boundaries. So it's not, uh, it's, it's less of a victim mentality, I think. I, I, I like that. How would that look like from this spiritual perspective and still holding our ground and saying, no, this isn't right. We will not stand for this. What does that look like to you, Mark? I think it depends on the situation and it depends on the nature of, of what the perpetrators are doing. So I'm going to leave that general in the general case because it, I think it depends. In, in some cases, it might be, for example, if there are medical interventions that you don't agree with is to say no, or if there are policies that come down from government that one finds immoral to say, I'm not going to do that. And I mean, the extreme version is Nazi Germany, where the law was to do things that were horrible to Jews and minorities. Um, the law was something that many people found immoral, and some people said no, and some people say yes. Right. So the slippery slope thing, though, right? I mean, there's yeah. been a lot of analogies to every day we hear the, the, the parallels with Nazi Germany, Nazi Germany. It's it, it, To a certain extent, it's a thing we always hear. It's like way, way too much play for uh, Nazi Germany there. They deserve every bit they get, but we can spread the hate around too, because there's a lot of people throughout history that have done the same thing and have done it in modern history as well. But sticking yeah. to the Nazi parallel, because it's easy, we're burning books now. I mean, the new CEO of Twitter who just, you know, just came out and said, I I'm not obligated by the First Amendment. That's not... I don't have to do any of that. And you're a Silicon Valley guy. I know I, I, this stuff, to, I just interviewed a guy from Google, AI guy, and he says, hey man, we got a, a trillion searches a day or some kind of crazy number like that. He goes, we got a scale problem. You know, and as a tech guy or close to tech guy, IP guy, you understand all the complexities that they are dealing with. At the same time, they are at the, they are at the heart of this evil in a way that, we can't quite pull apart. I mean, it, it seems to suggest that they're part of this system that could potentially be all that Nazism that we're all so worried about. And let me make sure I put a point on that so people don't think I'm just kind of rambling around. We're burning books right now today, essentially, right? When you're banning people, deplatforming people, people who have uh, PhDs, have a long history of publishing in peer-reviewed medical journals, and they're pulled from all the platforms, being YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, which for as long as we've been a country would be considered protected under the category of freedom of the press you know it's just a different technology but we would have always always considered that we're in different territory and that territory looks a lot like what we're talking about here so i don't know you know how far are we down that that road well, first, I want to comment on what you said about Nazi Germany. I, I agree that it's one of many examples, and there are contemporary examples we can point to that aren't just discussed as much. But I, I like to mention it because it's an extreme that many people acknowledge as real, uh, but we shouldn't forget the others. Where are we on the spectrum of you know, on liberty? I, liberty is eroding at a, an alarming rate. I mean, to the, I felt there was urgency to write this book, and it's not a comfortable topic to be talking about. And it's I'm sure many people will have differing opinions on what I've written, uh, but I felt like it was necessary anyway because of exactly what you're saying, Alex, that everywhere we look, there is an ideology. And if you don't agree with that ideology, whether it's medically or politically or anything, you're a conspiracy theorist, you're spreading dangerous misinformation, which are, these are very anti-scientific ideas. The, the exploration of science or anything in the world is to explore and to explore many different theories. And right now, there's less and less of an inability to do that. Uh, one of the things I looked at in this book is the impact of mind control, uh, propaganda, brainwashing through multiple venues. So mainstream media, but also through social media and tech. Because if we think about the way in which we view the world and the way 
the reasons that we have opinions about the world are informed by what we personally experience, which is very limited, and what we're told. And that comes about through social media, the news, books we read. And if what we can research outside of our own individual experience is being limited intentionally, where certain ideas, no, we can't talk about that. That's going to be censored. That's going to be shadow banned, where you can't see it as easily. Then there is a capacity to alter consciousness on a mass scale, a capacity to literally mind control and brainwash people. But from the, the skeptical lens, it's, a lo- it's consciousness manipulation. You are shifting people's consciousness in a certain direction. And if all reality is just consciousness, what happens when many people put their consciousness in a certain direction? This gets into phenomena like psychokinesis, the idea that mind can impact matter at a physical level. And that's how I look at it is, and that's my, one of my biggest concerns is that you could take good people, move their consciousness in a certain direction, and it can shape our world in a way that is not favorable. I wanna pick up on a couple of topics you just mentioned. Uh, mind control and the assault on science would be two of the ones that I think are, are critical to kind of flesh out here. But I got to start with the first one in that I'm really concerned about the way that this community, the Frontier Science, I'll call it community, you're a board member of IONS, I should mention, and you're kind of plugged in. And you mentioned like Bruce Grayson. Boy, I just interviewed Bruce Grayson. And on one hand, fantastic. Who can't love the tremendous, tremendous contribution that Bruce Grayson has made and those people at UVA have made. But at the same time, wake the fuck up. I mean, I kind of really pushed him on the conspiracy surrounding near-death experience. And, you know, you can go and everyone can sit around and clap hands and, oh, wow, you guys have done so much. Screw that. You haven't done anything. You haven't made any real dent. You haven't moved it. But what really pissed me off is to even suggest to Bruce that there is some conspiratorial nature to the uh, sidelining of near-death experience to the to the quote-unquote uh, skepticism about near-death experience to me that has been made patently obvious over the last 10 years but the real trump card on it is it's now made even more obvious by what they did with covid but if you can't call it if you're on frontier science and you can't call it and uh, you know after i after i interviewed Gr- grayson i interviewed Eben Alexander. And he was at least willing to come a lot closer to acknowledging it because he fucking lived it, right? He lived Sam Harris coming out of left field saying, this guy is completely lacks any credibility. While he's a a neuroscientist, a neurosurgeon at Harvard Medical School, and Sam Harris is a kind of a nobody intellectually to be throwing stones. It's not accidental. It is systematic. It is part of this mind control project that's been going on, part of the disinformation project that's been going on forever. And to a certain extent, I guess the reason I get so hyped up about it is that if we can't call it from what we've seen in the last 10 years in the frontier science consciousness community, if we, we were, we were there, we were the frontiersmen, arrows in the front and arrows in the back. We should be the people that said, look, here's how it happened back then. And here's how it's being amped up 10 times in terms of the co-opting of science, really the just complete assault on science. So I kind of covered a lot there in the rant, but I do want to kind of call out the, the frontier science people for not getting on board with the with the conspiracy stuff. Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, I'll just leave it. I'll leave it at that. I'm getting too worked up. <laughs> well, I hear you, Alex. I think it's uh, th- there seems to be a divide. I've noticed not only in the frontier science community, but also in the spiritual community. And the way that I look at it at the highest level is that it's perhaps an inability and an unwillingness to recognize evil and the the hiddenness of evil to say, well, I don't see how that could happen. I can't understand the mechanism for how someone could do that. Therefore, no, it must be that we'll take the benign explanation, which is that it's just that people can't shift their paradigms, which is part of it too. There, uh, There are probably scientists out there who just can't shift their paradigms. They're not part of a PSYOP and they just are, that's how they are. But this seems to be systematic, the way in which there are there are six sigma statistical results. And Dean Radin talks about this in his book, Real Magic, which was endorsed by two Nobel Prize winning scientists. 
in the categories of telepathy, remote viewing, precognition, and psychokinesis. That means the odds against chance are more than a billion to one, meaning in any other area of science, that's a real phenomenon. And yet, if you talk about psychokinesis, if I talk about that to my professors from Princeton, they'd probably tell me I'm crazy. How does that happen? There, there's something, there's, there's a suppression going on. I, I would say that I'm probably more open to this because of my professional experience. And maybe you have a similar experience, Alex. I saw stuff. I, I saw corruption firsthand in a way that is, was very damaging to people's lives. So I worked a lot with intellectual property. I, I, was, I was in investment banking in New York first, which was more tr just traditional stuff, not in tech. Um, but then I worked in the tech space where we worked with inventors at large companies and small companies who were challenging paradigms. So an invention, a, a patented technology is one that is both novel and non-obvious. That's the legal definition relative to the prior art, everything that, that's been done in the past. Meaning that if you get a patent on something, you're contradicting, you're contradicting what the mainstream is doing. And there's a lot of pushback often. So you can imagine what might happen when you have some smaller inventors going up against big companies. What could happen where the big companies who have lots of power can manipulate the system? So I saw it. I've seen the media manipulate things. I've seen the, the judicial system get manipulated all up and down um, the power structures. So I'm, I'm more open to it. And then I saw the same thing when I started researching consciousness. I'm like, what's going on here? It's the same thing. They're, they're calling these people pseudoscientists and there's tons of evidence to suggest that they're actual scientists doing probably more rigorous science because there's so much scrutiny. And then the whole COVID thing happens and it's the same thing. A person has a, a somewhat benign observation that contradicts the mainstream narrative. They're booted off YouTube. So there begins to be a pattern and one has to recognize that not everyone is moral. I think most people are good. That's been my observation. But some people are at the extreme end psychopathic, which is a psychological phenomenon in which a person doesn't understand empathy and just wants power. And at a spiritual level, this could relate to dark forces. Uh, that's how I look at it. But at a more mainstream level that everyone can acknowledge, psych psychopathy is a real thing. And most of us can't relate to it. So one almost has to go into the mind of evil to try to understand it. And a lot of people, I think, don't want to do that or they're not, they've are not they never done it before and they're happy living their lives as is. And I want to just close with one anecdote before I let you respond. A friend of mine, well-educated, said to me when we were, when I was first getting into consciousness research and I was sending a bunch of my friends, you know, the research I was doing and how it changed my life. Oh my goodness. Like there's, there's more to life than what I thought. There's actual meaning. And he was like, Mark, my life's pretty good and I don't want to rock the boat. So I, I'm not going to go down this road with you. I actually think you might be right, but like, I'm not going to go there. I think a lot of people are in that boat, especially when it relates to evil, because the other topics with consciousness, they're very comforting. And some people will say, yeah, it's comforting, but it's just too much for me. This stuff is, could be terrifying for some people. And they might say, I don't want to do it. I think what you've said is just super profound and it directly parallels kind of the path that I've been on. And if, if we we're going to retrace those steps a little bit, so we look at, again, our frontier science, and I'm going to hold Bruce Grayson up as the punching bag again. And he's done all this fantastic work in bringing forth near-death experience. But when you push him and you say, Bruce, this has really been about consciousness all along and about science being built on this notion that you're a biological robot in a meaningless universe, and that has a purpose behind it. And the purpose is people are easier to control if they believe that their life has no meaning. And even if there's all this cultural push in the background in terms of religion, in terms of wisdom traditions, and just in terms of human nature to say, well, I know my life isn't meaningless. That doesn't matter to the mind control culture shapers. You still play that game. You still push that button, just like we see the fear button being pushed now, and you don't stop pushing it. You just keep pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. So that's what was going on. That's what I suspect, and I think you're alluding to, is going on with the, you know, near-death experience well we're not sure you know this it, because it, it's a direct assault on this idea not just about the epiphenomena of the brain which immediately goes i don't care about epiphenomena of the brain i don't even know what it means what it really means is that they're trying to tell you that you are meaningless that you your soul doesn't really have a, a play in this larger game of your life and then I would tie that back to what you said about uh, how science plays that out and how science wants to play the game. And they say, 
Dean Radin. God bless Dean Radin. Six Sigma result, one after another, you know, a, a observer effect, you know, we'll just put a, all that kind of stuff. As Quantum Doug told me on the show, you know, a lot of people have gotten Nobel Prizes for less, but I'm digressing slightly because what I wanted to bring up also is part of this. And I think it has to all be laid out so that we can understand how the game is being played, because some of it is go along to get along in science. And this is the path of least resistance. And we get it. And do I really want to sit down at that dinner I'm going to with all my friends in the psychiatry department at University of Virginia? And do I really want to feel that uncomfortable that they're all looking at me because I really came out and said what I really believed and I didn't couch it in all this careful, maybe kind of crazy middle ground kind of stuff? Do I really want to endure that? You know, and do I really want to endure then going socially, going to the club or going to the whatever and, and having the same thing happen. But the other thing that I think is at play is the Stockholm syndrome, which is that, you know, these people have now been in academia. They've been subjected to this for so long that they're kind of happy captives within, you know, they've kind of have been blinded to what their science has really told them. And, and again, the reason I keep bringing it up is because if frontier science can't be the, the tip of the spear on this, we're in trouble. I want to give a quick shout out to Dean before I respond to, to that, which was, which was important, Alex. Dean has a new study out, which is to me totally mind blowing, which shows that the mind impacts the, the level of quantum entanglement and your listeners might not be aware because it just came out so i just want to say that's a new study of course it will need to be replicated but this is game-changing stuff it would impact quantum computing and, and beyond but with regard to academia and the scientific community and what what should the frontier scientists be doing as you were talking alex you reminded me of what i was asked once on a panel of well, how do we get this message out there and one of the scientists who was on the panel with me said well we need to we need to change the education system and get the message out there, which I agree with. And I was at my answer was it's going to have to come through the media because there's plenty of science and the message just hasn't been amplified properly. And the more I look at the media, the more I realize that's going to be a challenge. So I do think it is important that within academia, there's more vocalization of this stuff, which it requires bravery and it requires taking risk. People could lose their jobs. They might not get tenure. This is what I hear all the time. So it's when you have to feed your family, you have to make trade-offs and make make tough decisions. So I, I mean, I'm not in that position, so it's hard for me to say. Um, but I, I think it needs to come from all angles to to get the message out there. And I'm just going to add real quickly. Being at Princeton, I, I was so indoctrinated with materialism. I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know it until I deconstructed things afterwards. It's deeply embedded into everything within the highest levels of academia. It's, it's almost implied. I mean, I was technically a psychology major, even though I started in economics and did behavioral economics. Um, I don't remember talking about the hard problem of consciousness or acknowledging that we don't understand consciousness and maybe it doesn't come from the brain. It was sort of this presumption throughout everything in the psychology department and otherwise. So there's this, this cultural rigidity, which, uh, is going to have to shift and i don't fully know the answer for, to it yeah i i agree and so let's talk about the book and it's very kind of out front I, I can't imagine how this is playing with some of your friends and you do sit on these panels and you do talk to a, a lot of these people and they care what you think but you also care what they think H how is this very conspiratorial book and I say it's conspiratorial because it's about conspiracy theories throughout the book is about conspiracy theories. The only problem is that they're all true, you know, so <laughs> uh, we can call them that because that's the, the common term. But how is this playing for you personally? It's not making you friends, I can't imagine. Well, we're still early. The book was re released very re recently and I haven't heard from all that many people. I've gotten a bunch of really positive responses and it might be that some of the more negative responses I just haven't heard from yet. And as the book gets out more, I'll hear from more and more people. But I, I can just say from having had conversations with people in my network who are much more mainstream, what I'm talking about is, is so out there. It is so contrary to the way they look at the world or things that they've even considered as possibly true. So I would imagine there will be pushback. Um, there was pushback with my first book talking about consciousness not coming from the brain. My second book talking about living a, a spiritual life given those assumptions. And now this book saying we have to rethink government and acknowledge the reality of evil and conspiracy in light of all that. But 
from a spiritual lens, personally, I have to think, well, what's, what's my duty? Why do I exist? This is my, my second book and end upside down living is a lot about this. And part of the reason I wrote it, I wanted to share with people approaches that have been talked about throughout time, many great spiritual teachers, but also to hold myself accountable. If I'm really going to be on the spiritual path, then I have to live life that way. So when I look at, I mean, everything is a balance of risk and reward, and I have to consider reputational damage potentially um, from, on, on, from one perspective, but from other, another perspective, people might really respect it. But I have to consider all, all sides of it. To me, the net benefit is it far outweighs the downsides because we're, I think, in an extremely precarious situation globally where liberty is being eroded at an alarming rate. It's disturbing to think about what could happen. And I'm in a unique situation where I, I left my firm actually right before the pandemic. I, I just didn't feel called to do it anymore. I didn't know what I was going to do next. And two books have come out. But I've been in this situation where I'm able to research and spend a lot of time focusing on this stuff, meditating, really thinking about it. And there's a, a duty, I think, to share that with people for those who are open, because we don't know what the positive impacts could be if even a small number of people shift their consciousness in a certain direction. So I often reference the butterfly effect, which is a real mathematical phenomenon where a meteorologist changed one of his assumptions by a decimal point and his outcome ended up being vastly different. His weather prediction was different. So the analogy that people often use is a butterfly flapping its wings, mathematically speaking, uh, flapping its wings in China, mathematically speaking, could create a hurricane in New York. <laughs> so uh, to me, it's, it's worth it from that perspective. Well, I, I also think kind of from a silver lining perspective, I've talked to a lot of people just individually that have made changes in their life as a result of the pandemic that are resets, resets mm -hmm. in a positive way. I, I know like for me in a small way, you know, I'm big into yoga and I used to go to, I, I'm, now I'm outside doing yoga and I made a little sign, you know, well, come join me and do yoga with me right here, you know, in, in beautiful Cardiff and Solana Beach and Del Mar where I live out on the beach. And it's like, I, I would never go back. I would never go back to being inside a, of a studio. And I'm trying to spend more and more time outside. I've talked to a bunch of people who, said, gee, you know, this really forced my hand in terms of homeschooling. And I homeschooled and now I love it. And I would never consider going back. So I, I, I love your reminding us about the butterfly effect. And I also think there are some unintended consequences, very positive unintended consequences that have come from people being forced to reset and then having enough of a spiritual core, like you're talking about to say, okay, how will I reset towards my spiritual goals and at the same time in alignment with pushing back with what I see as some bad things that are happening to our culture? What do you think about the silver lining thing? Mm. So I, referencing my second book again, An End Upside Down Living, another approach in addition to forgiveness I talked about for life is non-judgmentalism, which is the idea that we we can't know at a cosmic level why things are happening. It's just way too complicated. We don't have the helicopter's perspective. It's almost like we are walking through a maze and all we see is what's immediately in front of us and we can't see what's way ahead of us. But if you had this perspective of the one mind, the broader consciousness that's beyond space and time, there's more to the story. So therefore we can't really judge things as quote unquote good and bad because there are these potentially unintended consequences. Someone has a tragedy in his or her life, but it can lead to amazing things later in life that were not foreseeable at the time of the tragedy. And at a, from the lens of spiritual awakening, people often talk about a dark night of the soul where they have a horrible event. And I, for me, I had one. So in 2016, when I first got into this stuff, I was listening to podcasts. I heard about you know spirits and just paranormal phenomena that I wouldn't have thought about before. Prior to that, I was I thought life was meaningless. Some things weren't going well professionally, like some deals weren't going the way I wanted. In my personal life, things weren't going the way I, that I wanted. And, you know, I'm such an accomplish, accomplishment focused person. You know, it was a tough time for me. Then I happened to stumble across these podcasts. My life shifted in a new direction. But I was probably more receptive at the time because I was in that dark night of the soul period. 
And now it's led to a very different life, which has been much more fulfilling over the last few years. So if you apply that at, to the collective level, I see what's happening right now as a dark night of the soul. Whether we will come out of it is is an open question, but I agree with you, Alex. There are unintended positive consequences. And on the, the really positive side, if we do come out of this, and I think if some of these corrupt systems are, are collapse or and or we're able to build new systems in parallel, we could have a world that is potentially so positive that we can't even imagine it. And that's what I try to hold in my mind. Let's talk a little bit about the assault on science that has been this pandemic, because that's one of the angles I've been trying to cover, because I, I don't normally like to get into those kind of topics or even current event topics. I try, although I really break the rule all the time, but kind of stay in my lane of science and spirituality. But again, as I've kind of maybe emphasized maybe too much in this show, I see a direct through line between the attack on science that was parapsychology, which, you know, both was, it's hard to say who won there. I think in some respects, like you're saying, Dean Radin definitely won, but in the larger sense, maybe he didn't win because when they can sideline the whole thing and just ignore it, then, you know, did you really win? But I'm digressing again, because what I really want to talk about is we're at a whole new level with the assault on science. I just dipped into a little bit of the mask science, the COVID mask thing. And the reason I like to stay with the mask is it's so much less controversial than talking about the virus and talking about the vaccine and all that. Just the mask. It's just phony science. It just, I look back at the interviews that I had, you know, with Sheldrick and Raiden and Richard Wiseman and the controversies. It's not even close to that in terms of being, it's so fake. It's like anyone should be able to see that it's fake. And our guard has been let down or maybe our fight has been let down but there's just no meaningful pushback on just the most atrocious science that has come with this pandemic and the uh, associated decisions that are being made off of it and it's something you cover in the book but maybe you want to talk about here at kind of that high level of assault on science kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah well we see it with consciousness science. I saw it professionally with some new ideas that were out there that, that were threatening to big companies. We're seeing the same thing now. If, if there's science that comes out that is threatening to the narrative, which threatens those who are in charge of the narrative, whoever those people may be, it's being shut out. So I, I've been trying to reconcile this too. And how do we deal with it? And how do we, how do we even communicate with those who believe the narrative so strongly? <laughs> I've been in this position, like I said, where I've had the time to investigate and to look at what the mainstream's saying, look at their claims, and then to actually look at some of these other studies and what the alternative people are saying and to evaluate both. I can understand for those who don't have the time to do that, if you're just super busy with work and your family and you just see what's on TV and you see the headline from CNN, who you've trusted your whole life and the New York Times, and you just go with it. You, who, 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 you think they're really going to lie to the world about something so big? It takes a lot to overcome that mentality. So it takes independent investigation. It, it, it takes a willingness to, to acknowledge the possibility of conspiracy and evil. And a lot of people don't want to do that. Um, but th the suppression is unbelievable. Uh, it's unbelievable in, in so many different areas of the pandemic, it, which continues for me to reinforce the idea that there is something going on. It's, it's not innocent because the suppression seems to go in one direction. It goes in the direction of fear. You should be more scared of this. And it goes in the direction of, we should take away your liberties as a result of that. That seems to be the direction of the manipulation of science typically. I wanna pick up on one thing you just said, and that is acknowledging the possibility. And it does relate back to the consciousness thing too. It relates back to the little anecdote you told about your buddy who said, you know, nah, thanks Mark find the way I am, you know, by the way, do you want to come over and watch the ball game this weekend? Please let's watch the ball game. I don't want to think about anything else. And I think back from to the total spiritual kind of perspective, we know that the, the, the spiritual masters and the yogis have told us all along that 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 doesn't change for people very easily. And it only changes when they're ready. And you can't shake somebody by the 
shoulders and say, wake up and see the science, wake up and see what they're doing to you any more than you can say, wake up to your divine spiritual wholeness, you know, wake up mm -hmm. to the, it, it, it's one in the same and kind of very interesting way that, that have you given any thought to those parallels of the spiritual awakening and the, the how many people do not, if we could, well, not how many people I can be, I'm there, right? I did not want to wake up spiritually. I was scared as crap of waking up spiritually because the associations I had with that in my life were my religious background of Greek Orthodox and it was scary as crap and it wasn't positive, but it was like, I didn't want to cut, touch that, that lightning rod or that electric wire or whatever. But there is a parallel now, I think, between that kind of reluctance to go through a spiritual transformation and this that we see with people who we talk to and the normies and the people driving around alone in their car with a mask on and you want to just go say wake up and it's like there's something much much deeper that they don't want to wake up to what are your thoughts on that <clears throat> well going back to the anecdote of my buddy we had the conversation maybe four years or so ago five years ago when i first was getting into consciousness and that was his reaction i don't want to go there mark i don't want to rock the boat this summer when i was talking to him about this new book same reaction different topic so it's like they're they're somewhat independent paradigm shifts, even though they're interrelated, because I think there is a consciousness element to all this conspiracy, which you've covered very well in your show. Uh, but they, they're somewhat independent and they can be siloed. So it's, it's similar. And as a result, we are seeing divides in the spiritual community of those who are spiritual, but will reject the notion of, of conspiracy and think it's dangerous and actually will think that liberty is dangerous somehow. Rick Archer has told me that directly, told me that directly, that you know, talking about any of this stuff is dangerous and conspiracy theories are dangerous and he'll contradict himself and then he'll, but he'll come back. It, 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 so, I, I mean, I've just got to call Rick out on that because it's over and over. We, we've, we've called each other out on it publicly and I've had him on the show and I've talked about a lot. So it's not like new information, but there was a classic case of somebody who's a very, very, very public figure, very important figure in the alternative spiritual community. I'll tell you another one is Jeffrey Mishlove. Did you see the thing that he recently came out with? I mean, it's like, what is he talking about? Has he completely lost his sense? Because the other way that we should tie this back to, because we talked about that other thing, is the, the people who see this as some kind of political play in this kind of left, right, red state blue state i mean has it what we has it what we've gone through thoroughly thoroughly convinced you that that is completely ridiculous and is just not really where the game is being played and yet you know people like jeffrey mishlov are completely attached to that in a way that makes it impossible to break through and have these next level conversations yeah well i haven't personally talked to rick about these issues. So I'm sure at some point we'll have an interesting conversation. I love his show, Buddha at the Gas Pump. I think it's one of the most important shows in terms of spiritual awakening journey and has really Absolutely. helped me. Absolutely. Um, but this this divide that we're seeing, it's, I've been the trying politics. to- talk, talk, Let me pull yeah. you in so, so that you're not asked to yeah. bash people that I'm bashing. I don't understand that pe people who insist upon seeing this through the traditional political spectrum, any more than I understand people in frontier science who insist on seeing this through all is right and well with science. We just need better peer review and they don't see the conspiracy behind it. So yeah. the, the politics of it, that's gone, right? There is no real left, right, red state, Democrat. That doesn't really fit the bill here, right? I agree with you completely. And it's a super important point because there's a paradigm that people are in of, well, if you're not a Democrat, then you're a Republican and vice versa. And if you believe this, then you're part of this political movement. And it's this very divisive mentality. One of the things that I, I try to do in my book and end upside down liberty is to uh, transcend that the left right division and get it more to the, the spectrum of liberty versus non liberty, because really the left and the right have differing opinions on what the other party should be doing, which to me is counter to principles of liberty. And then that mentality becomes warped into an us versus them. And it, I think, can warp our ability to objectively look at science because you might hear an opinion from that 
let's say if you're a Democrat, that, oh, the right wingers are saying this is true scientifically. I'm not a Republican. I think Republicans are evil, some of them, and therefore, and because I'm a good person, I can't agree with that science. It's like this this weird warped logic that removes objectivity from the situation, and I think it allows for greater mind control. I agree. One last topic, and it's a topic I always bring up because it just has to be front and center in this discussion. And it's it's difficult because it, it totally throws people for a loop, but that's E.T. at UFO. Mm -hmm. And we're right in the middle of it. We are at an unprecedented point in history where this has been acknowledged. And, the, and they've released the videos in the most phony political psyop kind of way, but there's no getting away from the evidence. And there's no getting away from the fact that despite what we all thought 10 years ago and Richard Dolan wrote in his book, After Disclosure, that they'll never disclose because then we'll never stop asking the questions. Why did you lie? Why did you threaten these families? Why did you kill these people? Well, they did disclose and none of that happened. And in some ways, it's a very discouraging uh, event as it relates to like the pandemic and the d destruction of liberty and stuff like that, because I think that is another example of something that's happened in the past that has parallels that's happened to, uh, to what's happening here. You don't think they can hide the truth? Hell yes, they can hide the truth quite well and they can lie about it for extended periods of time and they can turn people in circles and they can co-opt whatever group you form and they can misinform and then they can come in and dribble in some good information, mix it into the pot. So that's all talking about the method of ET UFO disclosure. Then there's just the implications of the reality of it. What does that mean in terms of us and where we sit in this world? What could that possibly mean in terms of if there is an underlying motivation behind this, if there is some direction behind all this craziness that's going on, could it be connected to this other intelligence or other intelligences, which seems to be the case. I laid mm -hmm. a ton on the table, so just pick what you want to talk about. Well, I'm really interested in that topic too. Um, and in my book, I mention the potential for metaphysical good and evil and what that means for everything. So in, the, in this book, I talk about, you know, I, get, I give some controversial views about politics, about the, the way in which government threatens liberty inherently and propose a new way of doing governing that's much more voluntary, which on its own, is going to give people issues, I'm sure. And then I throw on the spiritual part too and say that we have to consider these other aspects that you mentioned, Alex, that there's a, a metaphysical aspect to reality and how is that playing into politics and how does it play into the meaning of life and why does why does politics even matter? How does that fit into metaphysics? A lot of political discussions don't go there. Uh, but staying on your point about ET and this idea of other intelligences more broadly, whether they're multidimensional beings, actual physical beings, from other dimensions and planets, I don't know. We have to consider it. We, there, it. It goes back to this idea of mind control and how much information is being suppressed. And you've covered a lot of this on your show, the, the ET phenomenon. It's, there's probably so much that we don't know and then certain things that we think are real that might be disinformation. Um, and then at, at, on a related note, how can these forces be tapped into for both good and evil? And to what extent is that being done to enact good and evil on the planet? And then you start getting into stuff that you've been looking at too. And I, I don't feel like I have a grasp on this, but I'm interested is looking at ancient texts, you know, the Gnostic texts and some of the ancient mythologies. What's, what's misinformation from that? What is just pure mythology and, and what might, where might there be hints of truth? So in my book, I, I actually quote uh, the Nag Hammadi texts, which were discovered in 1945. Uh, farmers were looking for manure and found these, uh, these, tablets there that seem to have been removed from the New Testament potentially. So that makes me interested. <laughs> Those who speculate that it's removed from the traditional religious texts, I, I get curious. Why, why might that have been removed? Is there something of interest there? And there's one of the texts within the Nag Hammadi scriptures is called the rulers. And there's a quote, I'm paraphrasing it here. They talk about when humanity left the Garden of Eden. They said, the, the text says, the rulers left humanity in a great state of confusion and to a life of toil so that they would be preoccupied with the things of the world and wouldn't have time to focus on the Holy Spirit. That to me sounds a lot like this world. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's super important. 
I don't know how to begin to kind of deconstruct it. So you've obviously listened to a couple of my things there. The one, the one place I start is what we do know in terms of what would have passed along, the non commodity Library, the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mentioned very interestingly the Dead Sea Scrolls and the connection with Josephus. I've had mm -hmm. a bunch of biblical scholars on. Everyone references Josephus, but at the same time, they acknowledge that it's just a terrible, terrible historical source that has created an incredible amount of havoc in terms of these books that we have that people live their whole life on and, and have, have generationally kind of look back, go, but mom believed it, dad believed it, granddad believed it. And that's a very hard thing to kind of pull yourself out of. But if I can, I'd, I'd switch back to the ET thing, because I always like to throw this in there, because even I forget it sometimes. In the, the, in the ET realm, one of the ways that there is community is being divided and it's fractured in a bunch of different ways is a lot of talk about consciousness as it relates to ET. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if ET is multidimensional. And I don't know why is everyone hung up on the nuts and bolts reality of it. So I'm going to pound on a drum that I pound on a lot is look at the nukes. So the UFOs fly over our nuke Air Force bases and one by one they go to each missile silo and they shoot down a red beam and they shut off each one of the missiles and this is reported from people above the ground the soldiers who are out there responsible for protecting the perimeter of the base it's also reported from inside the guy who's responsible for pushing the button and sending those missiles on their way to russia and he's like there is no way this can happen but it just happened and E.T. did it. What does that say about E.T.'s ability vis-a-vis -vis our technology? What does that say about the moral imperative of E.T.? E.T.'s NDE, as I like to say. It, it begins to hint at it in the same way that you take, and I do too, take the near-death experience accounts and say, we can't take these literally, but what do they begin to suggest? And then switch over, if you would, to the Ukraine, where the UFOs did the same thing, but instead of turning the nukes off, they turned them on. Mm -hmm. And they went to the silo and they shot down the red beam, and one by one, they turned the nukes on. And the Russian soldiers were like, what are we going to do? The earth will be destroyed. We have no way of stop. We're not in control. This is our most advanced technology, and we're not in control of it. And then the ETs turned them back off. I don't know what that means. I don't know how many different species there are, how many different intelligences there are. I don't know about time travel. I don't know about the rest of it. But people who want to dismiss UFOs and ET as purely a problem that has to be, can be chalked up to consciousness and some kind of interdimensional hocus pocus that we don't know of are missing the point that they have demonstrated a mastery of our most advanced technology and that would kind of give should give us pause on both those fronts in terms of the nuts and bolts reality of it not that there isn't a consciousness reality of it too but then also what could potentially be the agenda on you know as we've been talking about on a spiritual level because they're telling us something on a moral level. And both you and I, Mark, would say, well, that moral level is really speaking to something on a spiritual level that we don't quite, or we, we get, but we don't want to quite go there all the time. Mm -hmm. what, are you, well, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll start with the reality of ET slash other intelligences that are out there. And I, I first like to go to John Mack and the work that he did Harvard psychiatrist look at looked at cases of abduction. I, I have his books; they're extremely well documented, very detailed. And he kind of reminds me of Dr. Ian Stevenson from the University of Virginia. Psychiatrist was looking at things very closely and was like, "Look, I, if I want to, if I want to take all these data points in, the most logical conclusion is reincarnation of all these kids with past life memories." John Mack seemed to come to a very similar place, and there are many others that have looked at this too, but. There's something going on. I don't think I'm an expert on it. There's a lot that I don't know and understand. But the fact that there does seem to be going something going on 
indicates we need to ask the questions that you're asking, Alex, is how does that interplay on a physical level with geopolitics? <laughs> what's, what's going on beyond what we can see? And it's, and it's very similar to the world of consciousness, why people have a hard time accepting it. it. It implies there are things that we can't access with our senses. And it also implies that there are things that we know, but we have an amnesia to. These are really hard concepts to accept because they shatter reality. And since I guess my reality has been shattered so much, I'm very open-minded uh, to at least the possibility. I don't know what's true and what's not, but I think we have to consider it. And also we have to be very skeptical of history um, because we're seeing right now that history is being manipulated, an event will happen and the news will frame it one way and that, that it might go down in the history books as hap having happened that way, when in fact it leaves out many other things. So how does that ripple into what's happened in the past and what has not been disclosed in the media that might have been more mainstream at one point, which could relate to ET or, or otherwise? And I guess where I would close on that is we have to consider it and look into it very closely. Absolutely. So, uh, Mark, we could I thoroughly enjoy all all of this, and you're you're such a deep thinker, and you're at another level that allows you to talk about all these topics and weave them together in a way that very very few people can. So I strongly encourage anyone to who's interested to pick up all of these books. If you're unfamiliar with an end to upside down thinking, you'll find it just really, really readable, well uh, sourced in terms of the support for what he's saying. And the same with this new book, An End to Upside Down Liberty. Where do you plan on going next? And, and what are you going to, I guess the book is just out now. So where do you, what do you want to do with it? And, and where do you plan to go next with it, Mark? I wish I knew. <laughs> My life over the last five plus years has been a continuous mystery of I follow what I'm passionate in and what seems to align with my values. So I'm going to continue doing that. And life seems to present itself with things that I need to do. So generally, that's how I think about it. But what I feel right now is there's urgency to get the message out about this stuff. So I really want to get the message out about the book and, and get people at least questioning these topics. I, I want to go back to something you said earlier about like, you know, should we be changing people's minds or are they on their own path? And for me, what I like to do is put information out and those who are interested might gravitate towards it. I, I'm not going to change people. And actually, I don't know their karmic path or their spiritual path. Maybe they're not supposed to change. So it's more about making things accessible for those who are interested. And that's generally how I look at it. Um, and we'll see where that goes. And I, I think also as, I, as the world unfolds in different ways, I might get pulled into uh, new areas. I think that's great. And I really, I really agree with you on, on one of the points that you made. I feel so strongly similarly is that, you know, we just have to do our best in personally figuring this out and figuring out how to take action, because I am a Western guy, too. You know, I love the Eastern philosophy of non dual. And sometimes that means non do, you know, don't have to do, you know, don't be careful about what you do. But I always remember talking to a guy and I won't mention his name, but he was in he was in the TM cult for a lot of years, you know, and he was celibate for a lot of years. And it's not Rick, by the way, but uh, although Rick was too, and then you know traveled the world teaching for their guru, and then only to find out he was all about having sex with his girls and you know raising cheating when the money and doing all that other stuff so you know be careful who you follow and stuff like that but the what this guy told me i'm burying the lead he said he got very serious and he goes never get between a seeker and their guru i'm like well mm. i'll take that one on myself well, fuck yes i'm gonna get between a seeker and their guru so if your guru is you know, we can name any any number of p people in the in the news who are cult leaders, but we can also name, you know, if your guru is any of the people who are peddling this pandemic, peddling, just trust me, give me all your uh, rights and all your liberties and you'll be fine. If that's your guru, I, I, I will get in the I will try and disrupt not physically, but intellectually, I will try and disrupt that connection. And I do feel like that's my job, because I think the foremost value is one love everyone, but two tell the truth. And that's mm -hmm. what I think you're trying to do. And that's what I'm trying to do too. We got to tell the truth. No choice. I agree with you, Alex. And I commend you for what you've been doing. You've been going out there on a limb with many topics and 
I've learned a ton from your show and I know your listeners have too. So thank you. Oh, well, that's nice of you to say, but uh, thanks. We're, we're colleagues in this endeavor. <laughs> Mark, it's, it's fantastic to talk to you and we'll have to do it again soon. Thanks a lot I, for coming on. I would love that. And thank you again for having me. Thanks again to Mark Gober for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview is, do you think frontier science, parapsychology, near-death experience, all the rest of it, has a special role to play in this kind of full frontal assault on science? Is there something special in what they discovered? Because the counter argument to that is, hey, that's just because you went and looked at parapsychology and you saw that. It's everywhere. It wasn't anything special about parapsychology and consciousness science over the last 10 or 20 years. It's really everywhere. And that's a reasonable counter argument. So I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on that. Track me down. Let me know. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.